Good afternoon and welcome to New America's virtual space, which we're so excited to share today with our organizational co-hosts for this event. The Bay Area Council, the California Working Family Coalition, the Child Care Law Center, the First Five California, Legal Aid at Work, Parent Voices, SEIU California, Small Business Majority, and UFCW Western States Council. My name is Vicki Shabo, and I'm a senior fellow with the Better Life Lab at New America. The Better Life Lab works in solidarity with the movement for work family justice to transform policy and culture so that people across race, class, ethnicity, and gender can thrive. Much of my work here and for the last 12 years has focused on advancing paid family and medical leave policies nationally, in states, and within the private sector. Like so many people, I got interested in this issue because of my own personal experience, which highlighted vast inequalities in access to paid leave within workplaces. I'm also a native Californian and take a lot of pride in my Golden State heritage. All of this is why I'm thrilled today to celebrate a historic paid leave milestone. 20 years ago tomorrow, September 23rd, 2002, California became the first state in the country to enact a paid family leave program to ensure that parents caring for a newborn, a newly adopted child, a newly placed foster child, and family members needing to provide care to a loved one could do so without losing all of their wages. California's program was built on top of its longstanding personal medical leave program, state disability insurance, which has provided wage replacement to working people through their pregnancies and recovery from serious personal health issues since the 1940s. Together, SDI and paid family leave support working people and families across the state. They've also provided a roadmap that 10 other states in the District of Columbia have followed. In New Jersey, Rhode Island, and New York, where there were sorry, similar programs to build on, and in Washington State, the District of Columbia, Massachusetts, Oregon, Colorado, Maryland, and Delaware, which have or are now building programs, they're doing that from scratch. And California's experience also substantially shaped the National Paid Family and Medical Leave Program that Congress came closer than ever to adopting last year. You'll hear much more about California's program today, its history, its legacy, the people and businesses it's helped, the research it's generated, and the improvements it's made over the next over the course of the next two hours. But I wanted to flag a couple of things that have stood out to me over the years. First of all, since its inception, paid family leave has provided leave to nearly 4 million people. Each of these represents a chance that someone had to hold a new baby's hand, comfort a loved one through a scary or serious personal health circumstance or other circumstances. And another 11.6 million people have taken leave for their own serious health issue, cancer, heart attacks, strokes, broken bones, and pregnancies. California's program has been studied a lot. Research shows that people take paid leave and come back to work. This goes especially for new moms and women who are mo most often providing care to their loved ones. But it also tells an important lesson about men in care. Because of California's paid parental leave benefit, men are now significantly more likely to take leave. When California's program started, men were about 17% of all new parents taking leave. And now more than 40% of paid parental leaves are taken by men. That is a huge shift and it's made possible by the interaction of policy and culture. We know that California's program as first passed was imperfect and that the state story is also one of progress and change. And this continues even now today as the governor has a bill on his desk for a signature that would expand paid leave in the state. Former President Bill Clinton said on the occasion of the FMLA, the Federal Unpaid Leave Law's 20th anniversary, that laws are breathing living monuments that are meant to change with the times. And California advocates and lawmakers have ensured that that's true. We'll hear much more about this from our three panels, lawmakers and staff who have crafted and improved the program, researchers who have studied it, businesses, workers, and advocates who are among those that have directly benefited or served people who have benefited from the program. In a moment, I'm going to turn the floor to my friend and colleague, Jenya Cassidy, the incredible tireless executive director of the California Work and Family Coalition. But first, just a little bit of housekeeping. We encourage you to post on social media using the hashtag CA paid leave. We encourage you to um, answer questions that we'll have in the Slido poll um, and to comment there for questions. And that's how you'll get questions to our panelists. Um, we are recording the event, so you can watch it again later or share it with colleagues. And thank you for being here. We wish we could be in person for this virtual celebration, but we're so excited to have people from across the country that want to come together to celebrate and learn from California's experience. And now I'm pleased to turn it over to Jenya Cassidy of the Work and Family Coalition for a brief overview of the Paid Leave Program's history and our sincere appreciation for its champions. Jenya? 
Thank you so much, Vicki. And thank you for your tireless work over the years. We've, we've just all learned so much from you. Um, and thank you to all of our state and national partners who helped put this event together and are working with us in California on equitable paid leave for all. Um, so the first slide you see is us celebrating a victory a few years ago. Uh, my name is Jenya Cassidy and I'm the director of the California Work and Family Coalition. And for those of you who don't know us, um, the coalition is an alliance of organizations that led the campaign to win paid family leave 20 years ago. Right now, we still continue to work on paid leave, of course, and all the ways that people have time for themselves and their family. So before coming to work for the coalition, I worked in a hospital as a union rep, and I got to help um, nurses and other hospital workers navigate the FMLA, the unpaid leave law. When they had a new child or they needed to care for a family member or take time for their own serious illness. But I especially remember one nurse who really needed a lot more time. Um, you know, we just didn't have as much time back then and she needed a lot more time after having twins due to complications and postpartum depression. In 2005, a year after Californians could access their paid leave benefits, I had twins myself and was thinking about how much easier it would have been for that nurse and so many other workers if we had paid family leave at that time. When we launched the campaign to pass paid leave, um, we won in the same year and we had a lot going for us actually. We had a really great grassroots campaign that was just starting, a really strong lawmaker, then Senator Sheila Kuehl, who was very passionate about the bill and also a very experienced lawmaker. We had the amazing leadership from the California Labor Federation and all the unions across the state and a governor then, Gray Davis, who really wanted a historic bill to hang his hat on as he moved on. So it was a really great year. We had just such, so many incredible grassroots leaders who set us on our path. Um, Joni Chang, who was with Asian Law Caucus and passed away really tragically a few years ago at a pretty young age, said during the campaign, it's not enough that what you wanna do is right and will help people, you have to involve them. And that's why organizing and coalition building is really at the heart of our work and at the heart of this movement today. So it's also part why we're part of, the coalition is part of the National Family Values at Work Network, which started really soon after paid leave passed in California, because if it was possible in California, it could happen state by state, and then really set a tipping point for the national, um, for national paid leave at some point. So Family Values at Work supports grassroots efforts, and I think being part of this network connected to other state coalitions has really enriched us. And it's actually just made our forward progress in California over the years possible. So as you can see here, we learned really early on that passing paid leave was only going to be the first step. Um, when we passed paid leave, of course, there were some compromises in our law. And we also learned a lot about what was and wasn't working about the law. So we worked to improve our law every year. And we've stayed together and worked to make it more equitable, expanding the definition of family, winning job protection, and this year, really fighting to make a very, very um, impactful change in wage replacement, which is something that you'll hear mentioned today. So this is just a picture of, the, of coalition members having a regional meeting, probably a pre-pandemic. And I just wanna say, I'm really incredibly proud of the work we've done collectively, um, not just the coalition, but coalition and partners across the state and really national partners all over the country um, to make pay leave a reality in people's lives. It's something that I've found in all these years of working that not one person um, doesn't care about time to care for themselves and their family. So I'm really, really proud of the work we've done this year with a lot of new partners. Over 400 organizations across the state have stood up to fight for a higher wage replacement rates for family paid leave and SDI. The bill that Vicki mentioned that's on the governor's desk right now it definitely takes all of us working together to win truly transformational change. And I wanna just take a minute to thank key leaders who've been with us along the way and are with us today. Um, first, this is just a list of our coalition members currently, and I just wanna thank them. I just feel very honored to work in unity with all of you for so many years. Many of you are in the program later today and will be able to hear directly from your experience on working on paid leave. Next, I'd like to just start recognizing some of the incredible leaders and champions who helped advance California paid leave over the years and just made incredible contributions. So Angie Way, co-chair of Governor Newsom's Paid Leave Task Force, helped push for SB 1383, a really monumental bill that helped with job protection. She was also with the California Labor Federation during the very first fight for paid leave. 
Anne O'Leary, former chief of staff for Governor Newsom and really a longtime champion of equitable paid leave at the state and national level. Um, Jessica Bartholo, great friend and great advocate for paid family leave right now, working with Senator Skinner as their chief of staff doing great work. Um, David Chu, who is the former assembly member and authored really innovative family, um, family leave policy and other family friendly policy and worked on a landmark bill that would help with language access for EDD. We just really appreciate uh, working with um, David Chu. Ellen Bravo, founding director of Family Values at Work, just incredible leader um, of national paid leave work. Irma Herrera, who was the former ERA uh, director and worked with us on the very first collective that fought for paid leave. Uh, Josie Calipeni, Family Values at Work director, who's just incredible innovative leadership on paid leave right now. The National Partnership for Women and Families has been with us from the start, even way before that, really at the start of the FMLA. They're just an incredible foundational group. A Better Balance fights for so much equity in paid leave and also is a great source of information if you're curious about how all our paid sick days and paid leaves laws work. CLASP has been an incredible partner on research and organizing. Lisa Gardner as, um, was formerly Senator Jackson's chief of staff and you'll hear from Senator Jackson later today. And she played a critical role in extending job protection, which ended up being a really long fight. And <laughs> now we have it for 6 million more Californians, thanks to Lisa and all the great work. Um, also, Jennifer um, Richard, who you'll hear from, worked with Senator Jackson, now with Durazzo, but you'll hear from her later, but also incredibly with us from the beginning. Um, Lorena Gonzalez, uh, now California Labor Federation, has just been doing so much both behind the scenes and up front on paid leave. And we appreciate her leadership and Glad she'll continue in her new role. Nancy Firestein, I mentioned earlier, obviously foundational to this work. Pat Shu, formerly of Legal Aid at Work and also the Department of Labor during the Obama administration. Um, she was part of that first collective. Patrick Henning, former EDD director, who was just a great friend to the advocates and a great friend to labor and um, has been a great friend to paid leave. Noreen Farrell, ERA, part of the very beginning and doing incredible work leading Stronger California, a great network across the state. Um, Senator Scott Weiner, he authored San Francisco's groundbreaking ordinance to provide 100% wage replacement for baby bonding in San Francisco. Great friend, supervisor and former state Senator Sheila Kuehl, um, just you know, obviously foundational to this work. Mariko Yoshihara Sela has been really great with um, all of our you know, work expanding paid leave. We couldn't do much of this without her. Wendy Chun Hoon, former Family Values at Work Director, now with the DOL, really proud to have worked with her. Um, next slide. So we have more incredible leaders <laughs> that are um, joining us today in many cases. So the Secretary of California Labor and Workforce Development, Natalie Palugai, is um, just like her predecessor, Julie Chu, she's championed innovative and community-centered outreach to connect families to paid leave during COVID. And we really uh, appreciate that so much. Assembly member Buffy Wicks has this incredible bill um, that would extend paid leave to, or extend family leave to more families. Uh, Assembly member Rendon, Kevin Kish, director of the California Civil Rights Department. Assembly member Cervantes, Latino caucus chair. Senator Gonzalez, Latino Caucus Vice Chair. Chris Perry, who is the former senior advisor to Governor Newsom and co-chaired the PFL Task Force and has a long history on a lot of great issues we, we care about. Senator Atkins, Atkins Pro Tem, her whole office has been really helpful to us. Senator Skinner, of course, um, super helpful with everything around paid leave and other issues. Attorney General Rob Bonta, former assembly member, my neighbor, well, at least down the street, it's his birthday today. If you wanna wish him a happy birthday on Facebook. Um, Supervisor Connie Chan, the San Francisco supervisor who also authored the Family Friendly Workplace Ordinance Amendments. And she's been a great uh, partner on these issues. Nancy Farias, director of EDD. We really enjoyed meeting with her on some issues recently. And Melissa Stone, director of Disability Insurance Branch of the EDD, who we meet with regularly to share what's happening in the field. Um, we also have Maurice Emselian, who's the Senior Advisor of Labor Work and Workforce Development and has been a longtime labor rights advocate. Mary Hernandez, Deputy Secretary for Legislation, Labor and Workforce Development Agency. 
and David Rattray, my friend, retired CEO and president of Unite LA. Also Representative Judy Chu, who as a US representative um, has just been a really great on paid leave in her district and across the country. And of course, there's actually so many more that I'm just thinking of some who are speaking today, like Representative Gomez, et cetera, who you'll hear from. Um, it would be impossible to name everyone who's contributed and you'll be hearing from a lot of these advocates, like I said, and champions and also some great researchers in today's program. So let me just say we're only getting started and I really look forward to working with all of you to realize the vision of all people having the time and resources they need to care for themselves and their families. Um, thank you and I'm gonna hand it over to Alex DiCaprio who will be emceeing this program today. And hello everyone. My name is Alex DiCaprio and I am a senior strategist at First Five California, California's Commission on Children and Families. First up today, I have the pleasure of introducing California Governor Gavin Newsom and first partner Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Paid leave champions themselves, they took time out of this very busy bill signing season to provide us with recorded remarks on what 20 years of paid leave has meant to working families in California. As many of you will recall, Governor Newsom campaigned on what he calls a parent's agenda with an expansion of paid leave at the forefront. And his goal was an ambitious one that by the end of his term, all babies born in California will be able to spend their first six months of life with a loving parent or caregiver, establishing a foundation for life success. One of his first actions as governor was to create a paid family leave task force to provide recommendations for how to achieve this goal. And I'm so proud to say that in 2020, we achieved step one of the recommendations, expanding job protected leave to 6 million more Californians through the governor's passage of SB 1383 by Senator Jackson, who we will hear from today. We are so excited to be working with the governor and the first partner on the remaining task force recommendations, including increasing wage replacement rates to 90% for low income earners, and look forward to the day when paid leave is accessible to all California workers who need it. Without further ado, Governor Gavin Newsom and first partner Jennifer Siebel Newsom. 20 years ago, California passed a first in the nation paid leave program that has helped tens of millions of families take much needed time to bond with new children or care for seriously ill or injured family members. And since it was created, the state has continuously worked on the program, but we wanted more for Californians. We wanted to ensure that every working person in the state can fully benefit from the program. Everyone should have time after giving birth to bond with their child, to start the healing process, to learn their child's rhythm and needs, and every working person should have time to care for or help their loved ones get the care they need, regardless of gender, sexuality, or relationship. Yeah, that's why in 2019, we launched the Paid Family Leave Task Force to identify how we could make Californians' paid family leave program even better for more Californians, and that includes some of you, many of you, in fact, at this event. The task force provided recommendations to ensure that paid leave truly benefits all working people, leading to a substantial expansion of job protections under the California Family Rights Act so more families have job security and can benefit from these programs. Our nation-leading paid leave program is family and small business friendly, and it creates an equitable and inclusive model, we believe, for the rest of the country. California's work on paid leave is complemented by our efforts to close the wage gap, our investments in early childhood, and our commitment to improving conditions for working people and their families. So with all of these efforts and the policies we've innovated right here in our state, we're building a stronger and happier California and creating at the same time a model for others to follow. So thank you all for the roles you played in California's paid leave program. Cheers to two decades and many more. Next up, we are thrilled to be able to share a message provided by the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi. A lifelong champion for women, families, and caregivers, I cannot think of a better person to help us kick off today's celebration. Speaker Pelosi led the charge to ensure that paid family and medical leave was part of the final Build Back Better package that passed the House of Representatives last November. And over her, enti over her entire tenure as the Democratic leader and speaker, she has brought issues related to women, children, and families into, the, into community and national conversations. While many of us were incredibly disappointed this year when the National Paid Family and Medical Leave Program dropped out of the Senate negotiations, we know Speaker Pelosi, along with House Ways and Means Chairman Richard Neal, continued forcing a dialogue even after others had given up. And for that, and for so many other things, we owe her a huge debt of gratitude. 
While we don't know when the United States will join every other industrialized nation in adopting a paid leave program, one thing we know for sure. When it does happen, and it will happen, it will undoubtedly be in large part to Speaker Pelosi's tenacity and unwillingness to settle for anything less than what our families deserve. And now, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Good afternoon. As Speaker, it is my privilege to bring warm greetings from Democrats in Congress as Californians proudly celebrate 20 years of paid family leave. Thank you to the coalition of tireless advocates who have put together this wonderful event and who continue to guide us forward. Two decades ago, the working families of our state made history, winning the country's first ever fa family leave policy. And in the years since, California has remained a model for the nation, paving the way for other states to follow our lead, while continuing to expand and strengthening the transform transformative achievement. Indeed, the fight is far from over. House Democrats are waging a battle to win paid family leave nationwide. Last year, we proudly voted to ensure no American has to choose between paying rent and caring for a loved one. We will not relent until paid family leave is the law of the land from coast to coast. But we can only get so far through our inside with our inside maneuvering. We also need your outside advocacy and mobilization. Thank you for knowing your power and for devoting your time, energy, and talents to this fight. Congress and the country are grateful for all that you have achieved and for all you continue to do. Best wishes for a lovely 20th anniversary celebration, and thank you. Big thanks to Governor and First Partner Newsom and Speaker Pelosi for those inspiring and grounding remarks. We are now going to shift our attention to the three incredible panels we have for you today. And as a reminder, we will be using Slido to submit questions. So Slido is the box located to the right of the video. Throughout today's event, we'll also be asking a series of polling questions to get to know our audience, which we would love for you to participate in. These polls can also be found in the Slido embed. If you have any questions or issues, please contact events at newamerica.org. Okay, we are thrilled to have Eleanor Moeller, a labor reporter with the news organization Politico, to moderate our first panel, celebrating legislative leadership and progress. A DC-based reporter, Eleanor describes her passion as vividly illustrating economic policy and its effects on real people. She has written extensively about paid leave and childcare, as well as organized labor, unemployment insurance, workforce development, wages, inflation, workplace safety, and a multitude of other work-related issues. Over the next 30 minutes, we're excited to dive into the history and politics of paid leave policy as it developed in California and the implications the state's policy has for the country. Take it away, Eleanor. Thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Nothing more to add, really. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. We've got Representative Jimmy Gomez, who is, of course, a member of Congress from California's District 34, which includes Los Angeles. He's also a former state assembly member. And throughout both of these roles, he's championed paid leave from authoring improvements to California's paid family leave program to being a key member of the powerful House Ways and Means Committee, which passed paid family medical leave for the first time last year. Um, we also have Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, who is a former member of the California Senate representing District 19. She's a champion for gender equity and the author of bills that would improve California's paid leave program. Um, by expanding the definition of family members who are eligible for the benefit and expanding job protections. Last but not least, we've got Jennifer Richards, who is the former chief of staff to State Senator Maria Elena Durazo, uh, former chief of staff to Senator Jackson, and a former staffer to the then Senator Sheila Cool, who is now the LA County Supervisor and the original author of California's paid leave program. Um, before we begin our panel, we're gonna 
hear from uh, Maria, who is currently champion SB951, a bill to improve California's wage replacement that has passed both chambers of the legislature and is now awaiting signature by the governor. Uh, just a note, you will hear Senator Durazo mention two other California paid leave pioneers whose schedule sadly prevented them from being here today. I want to begin by thanking the New America Foundation and the other organizations for sponsoring this event. I also want to acknowledge the work of the other elected officials on today's panel. We owe a debt of gratitude to all of them. Congressman Jimmy Gomez, former State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, current LA Supervisor Sheila Kuehl for creating the nation's first paid family leave, and my friend and former Assembly Member Lorena Gonzalez for laying the foundation for my bill, SB 951. Workers making under $20,000 per year make up 37% of those who pay into the fund, but only 14% of paid family leave claims. This isn't because lower income families are experiencing fewer health crises or pregnancies. They are just being forced to keep working through them. California's low benefit rate unfairly harms Latina mothers in particular nearly three in five of whom below, live below federal poverty line. For that reason, I introduced SB 951, which would provide lower paid workers earning less than $57,000 a year, a 90% wage replenishment. As I record this, the bill is on the governor's desk, awaiting his signature by September 30th. The governor has a clear decision to make. He can let California fall even further behind or he can sign SB 951 and ensure that all Californians are able to benefit from these important programs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for providing that video. So I'm excited to dive into our conversation today. And Jennifer, I actually want to start with you because you have served so many of these lawmakers that have been at the forefront of the passage and efforts to improve California's paid leave program for the last two decades. Uh, that, of course, is included, but by no means limited to the current push for SB 951. You know, you've really had a front row seat and been in the trenches from the very beginning I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, what are you most proud of? And can you talk a little bit about what that process has looked like of helping the program grow over time? I'd say I'm most proud of having been involved with the creation of the Paid Family Leave Program and having uh, worked with this incredible uh, group of advocates over the past 20 years on helping to enhance that program. You know, when we uh, first introduced that bill, they thought it would be at least a five-year campaign to try to get that through. And I don't think the folks who are making those estimates uh, uh, carefully enough evaluated how fiercely people will fight to protect their families. And really, paid family leave is about protecting our families. It's a very core issue, I think, for a lot of Americans. And there was much greater uh, support with the general public because of that. And that what gave us the lift uh, that we needed to actually move that program uh, through and establish it here in California. Uh, and over the years, uh, we've worked to improve that program to serve the needs of more and more um, Californians. Um, uh, when, you, when you staff a bill, uh, you hear very quickly uh, praise and gratitude for the, it going into law. And then shortly after that, um, uh, concerns about things that it's missing, uh, the people that don't benefit, that folks feel that they should have benefited from it. And we heard right away after paid family leave went into law, um, a, about uh, additional family members. I got a very compelling letter uh, from a sister who had uh, spent, had gone and spent weeks with her uh, uh, dying brother to care for him at the very end of her life. And how, though she paid into the program, she was not able to access the benefits for the need that she had to care for her family at their time of need. Um, and that's, uh, and, and years later um, with Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, um, uh, that law was uh, chained uh, to expand to cover more family members. And I know um, Assemblymember Wicks has legislation to cover even um, more family members uh, to uh, fa our family of choice, which is particularly important to the queer community. Um, and, um, 
And likewise, we also heard uh, about the need for low-income Californians to be able to access this benefit program. Uh, currently, if you're a full-time minimum wage worker, you take a 40% cut in pay to access this benefit. And a lot of folks just can't do that. So they uh, narrow the amount of time that they're out, not to meet their family's needs, but just to survive so that they can put foot on the table and keep their apartments. Um, uh, but they're paying for this benefit just like all other Californians. And so it's been important for us to continue to press uh, to, exchange, to enhance the benefit for those low wage workers. Absolutely. Um, Representative Gomez, I want to go next to you. I understand that you are joining us from your own paternity leave. Yeah, no, I am. It's uh, it's definitely been an experience. I've learned a lot since I've uh, uh, my wife uh, became pregnant and we uh, during those uh, few months, those nine months and then plus the um, the birth of the child and then just kind of the, what they call the fourth trimester. Um, and a lot of the challenges and, and it is um, challenging under the best circumstances, having the, the, the resources, having the income, having health insurance, um, all of that makes it, uh, you know, having children and take care of children extremely, extremely challenging and, and we're quite fortunate. And I just try to remember how my mom did it when she had six kids, worked minimum wage jobs, four to five a week to make ends meet. and um, and they got by, but it's not about getting by. It's really about making sure that the, the mother is healthy, the baby is healthy, and, and the family um, is better off in the, in the long term. So it's been, um, uh, it's been uh, eye-opening in some respects. I learned something about postpartum pre uh, preeclampsia, which I had no idea was a thing, and, and it often is undiagnosed. And um, most women, I think there's some staggering statistic of the number of women that die after birth is because that's not caught so and there's very limited research on it so it's something that it, it's made me kind of think about things a little bit, bit differently but we definitely need to um, broaden and strengthen paid family leave for for everyone especially to um, to make sure that the especially for the lower income individuals that don't have the the resources and their savings accounts in order to hire doulas or nannies or caregivers to help them get by in those difficult times. Um, but I think this is a celebration of the 20 years of the passage of the paid family leave in California. If it wasn't for that program, we wouldn't be having the discussion now about a national program. Um, this is, uh, and I think that California should be proud of it. And it was not a perfect program. We had to kind of think about it and, and see how people used it and how employers used it and then started tweaking it over the years, right? Pro progress, uh, legislation isn't perfect when you first pass it, and it's never perfect. What you're doing is you're tweaking it along the way. So everybody from Hannah Beth Jackson to my bill, AB 908, everything has been to how do you make it better and more accessible and have the impact that you want. Um, so we're, we're on our way here in California. I'm glad Maria Elena has taken up the mantle of uh, higher wage replacement. Um, and we were going to try to do that throughout California. When I got to Congress, nobody was talking about equity. We've been talking about equity for over, at least in my, since I got elected to uh, the State Assembly back in 2012. Got to Congress in 2017, and I talked about equity, and people looked at me like I was crazy. So um, it, it is how we build broad-based support for any kind of policy, but especially for paid family leave, where we really do want to have um, the people at the at lower runs of the economic ladder get those direct benefits. So um, people should be proud of what we've done. Let's keep moving forward and, and then use the what we've learned in California to, to justify why we need a program at the federal level, because we know what we're better off today than we were back in the early 2000s. Yeah, you touched on this a little bit, but I'm curious, you know, one of the things that you've championed has been a higher wage replacement rate. Um, how does that, you know, address all of these issues of equity that you speak to when it comes to, you know, racial, ethnic, and economic parity? Yeah, no, one of the things that we, um, when uh, I read a lot of the reports from the 10-year report that was done by the Senate Labor Committee uh, uh, that kind of explained some things and having discussions with folks, and it's pretty much they we've described it as a three-legged stool: job protection, um, making sure people can go back to the job that they had, um, the wage replacement, right, 
and knowing about the program. A lot of people still don't know about the program. So wage replacement was one of the um, one of the um, barriers when um, when you're making above eighty thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars, you have more savings than somebody's making forty five or fifty thousand dollars or less, and um, they can subsidize whatever they don't get. If the wage replacement is 60, 55%, well, they can subsidize their own with their own money. But working class people can't do that. Uh, my parents worked, you know, like I said, four to five jobs a week and barely survived on 100% of their income. So what makes anybody think that they can take time off at 55%? And these workers are paying into this program. So um, we kind of saw that as a barrier and we still need to look is that enough, right? Increasing the wage replacement, is that enough in order to get people to use the program or are there other barriers? You know, just knowing about it was, it was a big barrier. Back when I was um, in the legislature, we put $3 million for outreach. Maybe that's not enough. Maybe you need to do 10 million. With the, the surplus they have at the state level, they should, we should be doing more to encourage people to take the, the time. But it is, it's not easy. Um, I know Hannah Beth Jackson worked on bills to lower the threshold of um, of the of what kind of size business that it applied to, right? So, it, it, wage replacement is key, uh, and I think the more um, progressive, like the more progressive it is, the more likelihood people are going to use it. And here's the thing: um, as long as everybody gets a little bit of a boost, right? The higher income folks get a higher, a little bit higher wage replacement. They're fine. They're going to support the bill. We we didn't get really any backlash from it. So it, it's how you kind of structure these programs. We want people to say like, yeah, it's no brainer. People should be able to take six months off, even longer to stay with uh, with a, a newborn child or adopted child, or uh, take care of a sick family member. Um, in the end, that will be better for those families, but it also be better for our country and our uh, communities as a whole. So uh, wage replacement is key. Um, but it, we also have to look at all the other little barriers that prevent people from accessing a uh, program that they pay into here at the at the state level, but then figure out what we can do at the federal level. Yeah, definitely. Well, speaking of those barriers, I mean, Senator Jackson, you have served, of course, in the state legislature for years, but you've worked on initiatives around, you know, job protections around paid leave. Um, and that's something that you and I were discussing before we got on the Zoom call just now. Um, your work succeeded in a huge way in 2020 when the California Family Rights Act was amended to cover workers in smaller businesses, which extended coverage to 6 million more workers. Can you walk us through what that effort looked like and you know why job protections as a whole make such a big difference when it comes to paid leave? Sure, well, part of it is that as uh, Jimmy mentioned and congratulations on uh, your uh, new status. Um, I wanna Thank just you. point out how wonderful it is when men participate in those particularly early moments and early months uh, they create a, a lifelong bond with their children. It benefits the child as well. It benefits the mom. And we've had to fight for that too. We had to fight to get 12 weeks of job protection uh, for women and, uh, and new parents to be able to bond with their newborns. In spite of the fact, all the data, all all the evidence, all the uh, information makes it very clear how beneficial this is to the family, to the child, uh, but it's a battle and this has been a battle. Uh, we had paid family leave and as, as uh, Jennifer pointed out, working with the great uh, Sheila Kuehl to get this passed in the first place, we were the first in the country, fast forward 20 years later and we're still one of a very few states that has this. It was one of the first things that got jettisoned in the federal pass package. Uh, so we had paid family leave, but the question was, who was it applying to? Who was able to take it? And one of the things that we discovered when we, uh, when I introduced SB 1383 was, first of all, the definition of family. You know, the 21st century family is very different than the 19th century family or the 20th century family. Uh, as, as Jen uh, pointed out, we have uh, people caring for their for their siblings, caring for a grandparent, caring for a grandchild who were not able to take family because the definition of family was too narrow. So we were able to expand that so that more people can care for their loved ones. But we also noted 
that a lot of people weren't taking the leave for the very simple reason is that you could take the leave, you could get a partial reimbursement, but you could get fired. Well, what's the point of taking leave if you're gonna lose your job? So what we did and fought hard for, and I wanna thank the governor for his efforts, Ann O'Leary, I wanna thank the organizations on this call today. This was an enormous battle that we won literally with three minutes left to go in that legislative session to get this bill passed. Why? Because corporations um, are still in many respects living in the 19th and 20th century. We are the 21st century. People don't live to work, they work to live. And I think that's a distinction that we need to address going forward, that we started to address with this legislation that says, if you have the need to care for a loved one, and we expanded the definition of family, as I mentioned, um, you get to take 12 weeks of job protected leave. Now, not all of it is paid. Not all of it is necessarily paid. You are entitled under California law to eight weeks of paid leave, which by the way, you pay for. And one of the things that I think has to be noted and emphasized is that the employer doesn't pay a dime into the paid family leave system. It is all paid by the employee. The employer, the only thing the employer is required to do is to maintain health insurance. If they provided health insurance, they have to maintain it for obvious reasons. You're going through a health crisis with your family. Um, so uh, it, it was really important that we address the reasons why people were not taking the leave. No guaranteed job when they came back to it. Um, we are also addressing the fact that has been mentioned on several occasions that the amount of reimbursement has got to increase, particularly for our lower wage workers who literally can't afford to take the time at 75% reimbursement rate, which was something that uh, then Assembly Member Gomez uh, was able to get passed. 75% for our lower wage workers. That isn't enough. So what we've done and what we must continue to do is remember that people uh, have this need to take leave, to, to take care of themselves and their families, and they need to be assured that their jobs are going to be available to them when they come back. It's good for the family. It's good for the job. It's good for the employer. When you have workers who come back after leave, they're refreshed. They appreciate the fact they've been able to deal with their family crisis. They tend to be more loyal. All the data, all the statistics show that this is a win-win. And that's why we need to keep fighting that battle. We're going to hear a lot more about the research and the business facets of paid leave in the next two panels, but I want to dig into the politics behind paid leave and all of these various improvements we've touched on. Um, paid leave, I mean, it, it's one of those weird policies where it has very high levels of public support across party lines, both in California and at a national level. But as you know, I mean, enacting these improvements has not always been the most straightforward process. Um, so Senator Jackson, I mean, from your perspective, what are some of the key forces that are limiting progress on paid leave in California? And how have you worked with, you know, advocates, but also other lawmakers to overcome them? Well, one of the biggest challenges has been working with the business community. Uh, the fact that uh, they operate on an old model. If you don't show up for work, you can be fired. Uh, we don't care what's going on in your personal life. Um, we prioritize, we value a person uh, their work persona more than their personal persona. And so people have been forced to work in, uh, in circumstances where they are oftentimes less productive uh, and, and frequently will have to leave a, a job because the, the demands are greater than they can meet. And so we have to work with the business world. The business community needs to better understand. And frankly, one of the biggest challenges anytime we try to modify the workplace is the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they, they come to us with an old model of work and they are, it's very difficult to get 
flexibility, very difficult to get them to recognize that they really benefit. When you have workers who are happy, when you have workers who are fulfilled, when you have workers who can take care of the other part of their lives, they're better workers. They're more efficient. They're more productive. Uh, they, they're more loyal. I mean, the, and, and I'm assuming that we'll see that in the, in the next couple panels. But the, the work environment. We have this fear factor. In fact, when we reduced from what was then 50 employees down to five, a company with five employees has to accommodate this leave. Uh, working with those people, recognizing there are ways to make this work rather than just to say no or just to say I need to get rid of that employee to be able to work with these companies. Ultimately, they discover that it is a benefit to them. So um, changing the discussion, changing the framework uh, for the, the work of the future and of the present has really been part of the challenge and the power, frankly, uh, of groups like the Chamber of Commerce, some of the business community uh, that is opposed to these kinds of reforms uh, has really been the most daunting task. But when we have groups like those that are here today, uh, when we have determined legislators like uh, Sheila Kuehl, like Jimmy Gomez, uh, like Buffy Wicks, like Maria Elena Durazo, and, and many of those that you listed early on in the front of this discussion, we are able to make those changes. And of course, got to give credit to the governor and the first partner who made this a commitment of theirs coming in the door. And you know, and I think Jimmy will agree, when you have four kids, uh, you get you get it. You understand the challenges associated with being a good parent, as well as doing good uh, and doing well at the job at which you work. Jennifer, your boss is one of those who has been working so hard to champion improvements to California's paid leave program, including those wage replacement rates that we spoke about earlier. What needs to happen next in terms of next steps? The next step is for the governor to sign that bill. Uh, it would provide 90% wage replacement uh, for lower wage workers, uh, those earning, you know, roughly less than in the in the mid 50s uh, and below, and all other workers would see 70% wage replacement. So it would be a bump up for all Californians taking paid family leave, and a tremendous benefit. Uh, and he has eight days to sign or veto it. Is there any kind of effort underway to sway him to sign the bill? We're asking everybody to reach out to the governor's office um, you, uh, uh, to tweet about it, to post on social media, uh, to make sure their support uh, for the measure is known. Gotcha. Zooming out to a federal level, um, Representative Gomez, you worked closely with House Ways and Means Chair Richard Neal, as well as you know House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, to ensure that paid leave was included in that Build Back Better uh, iteration that passed last November. Wow, I can't believe it was in November. Um, but progress was stalled, as we know, mostly by you know one Democrat, he who will not be named, and all of the Republicans in the Senate. Uh, I'll phrase it this way. I mean, what do you think the, the people who are standing in the way of paid leave don't understand? Um, and how, what is the best way of, you know, conveying that to them? Well, I, I learned in, in um, my days in the legislature that um, oftentimes elected officials use policy as an excuse of how they're voting for something. But politics is the reason why they're voting for something. And in order to kind of get down to the political reasons, you got to like swat down any of their excuses. And when you had discussions with Manchin, where people had discussions with Manchin, he would just um, have one policy excuse over another. Like, uh, you know, uh, oh, people are going to uh, use the time off to go and go uh, go hunting well, it's like well it's kind of hard to pretend that you had a kid or not right or that you're pregnant or not um so it's uh a lot of those ex excuses they just don't hold any water so you have to knock them down in order to isolate okay what's the real reason is it like your is the business community your estate or you just don't believe in it um and it seems like um for some members they just don't believe in that concept right uh, I think it's a little outdated. I mean, every industrialized 
country on um, on the face of the planet has some version of paid family leave, which is more generous. I had a friend who was, was recently married to somebody from Belarus, and I told her how I, I thought it was a big deal about my paid family leave bill and how much it it uh, it, uh, it provides for time off, and uh, she laughed, right? She just laughed. And this is Belarus. It's not like a, an economic juggernaut. It is, uh, and and I think that's kind of where we're at. We're kind of in the we're isolated on the idea that people should be able to take time off. Um, so we're in a good place, though. Like. I just want to remind people, up until a few years ago, we didn't even have hearings on paid family leave and ways and means. We didn't have these um, broad-based discussions. So we've moved the ball forward, but that's also because the states are the laboratory of democracy and good public policy. Fun, bad public policy if you go to like on other issues like Texas and Florida on other issues. But, you know, we, we're spread, spreading the word of paid family leave. More people are uh, believing in it. More people are asking for it. Um, and there will be a pressure one, uh, one day that they want a national program because it's easier. The trick is to make sure that every national program that is implemented doesn't undermine the progress that we made on our, our paid family leave program here in California, right? We're not going to, you know, trade a, a program in California that might be the gold standard for a program at the national level for all these other states that, you know, we that we were it was where we were 20 30 years ago right that's not gonna we, we don't want to be there so um we got to knock down those concerns and then give the, enough flexibility for a national program that makes sense that doesn't undermine what the states have done uh given their individual program so it's we're not done this is uh getting it past the house was a big deal now we need to uh, make sure that we can do it again and again and again until we get the senate um to take it up and pass it awesome um, so we've got time here for one audience question for our panel members. As a reminder, you can submit questions using Slido. Um, let's do this as a popcorn round because I would love to get everyone's, you know, two cents in. Um, and I think it's especially relevant. So we saw last week, both Republicans and Democrats introduced paid leave as part of a broader messaging package around specifically reproductive rights and kind of this idea that these are the things we need to have in place um, if women in the U.S. are not able to access abortion now that Roe versus Wade has been overturned. Um, let's just start with you, Jennifer. I mean, how uh, does paid leave connect to reproductive rights? And how, you know, how has that Supreme Court decision really affected the conversation around paid leave? Well, there's a strong, very strong link uh, between paid family leave uh, and maternal uh, and child wellness. Uh, without paid family leave, people have to make a very difficult decision about how much time, despite their doctor's recommendations, um, uh, some people are taking less time off uh, prior to the birth of their child because they simply can't afford it or because they're hoping that maybe they can just squeeze out a couple weeks with the baby after the baby's born. And when they make those, they're put in that devil's decision, they're, uh, they're placing their own life at risk and uh, the, the child's life potentially at risk uh, there. And when people have robust paid family leave benefits, they're more likely to take the early care uh, that they need uh, if they need bed rest before uh, 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 birth and have time to recover uh, uh, from uh, a childbirth. And Representative Gomez talked about uh, uh, the risk that still is present for women after a child is born and how important that uh, uh, post-birth period is for uh, care for the mother. Um, paid family leave can be used uh, for uh, accessing the doctor's care. Um, it can be, um, it's very important to families and also knowing that there's, uh, there are weeks available to bond with that child uh, after the child comes into your life is very uh, important in the, it, um, uh, mothers are more healthy uh, when their partners take leave uh, to, to, to help uh, with the baby after the baby's born, the whole family overall uh, uh, does better. Uh, because of paid family leave. And we have to look, if we care about uh, reproductive choice, we should look at the whole uh, panoply of uh, reproductive health 
issues and concerns for women. And this is definitely a strong and important part of that. As Senator Jackson, we'll go next to you. What's your view of how you know reproductive rights overlap with paid leave? Well, I think it's really important that that uh, we shouldn't use paid leave as an excuse to deny women the right to reproductive choice. I think that's critically important. Uh, but or and I should say, if a woman uh, does uh, wish to. Um, go through with the pregnancy, uh, there certainly should be those options available as a matter of fact. It's a question of respect. Uh, we know that women who are able to take time to bond with their newborns are uh, something like a third less likely to go through postpartum depression. Uh, we know that their, their mental health improves by their ability to uh, provide that nurturing. We know that the infant benefits we know that having a partner share the experience, uh, a, a non-biological parent, but who is still a parent, uh, it creates a lifelong bond. Nothing like getting up at two o'clock in the morning and changing diapers and having to do a, a feeding and then being up again at four. I mean, there's a real commitment that's made. And I think it's critically important that we have greater respect for the whole process, greater respect for uh, the woman, her decision making, and we need to support that. We are the only, frankly, industrialized country in the world that does not, and it's inexcusable that we don't. Uh, so I think that it is part of our whole discussion, but again, they are not um, mutually exclusive, uh, and we need to make sure that women have that choice regardless, uh, but that certainly if we are truly serious about the health of mothers, the health of babies, the health of families, uh, that paid family leave has to be there in a robust and realistic fashion. Congressman Gomez, last but not least, same it, question. Yeah, um, first I agree with um, Senator, the Senator about um, just more respect for, for women when it comes to the issue of uh, uh, pregnancy and, and birth and just all around I actually to an extent where I I joked around I said I don't even know why babies have the last name of a man Re really <laughs> to be honest with you it's just what I saw my wife go through I was like wow and maybe that's why we um, named my um, son Hodge Grant Gomez Hodge after my wife's last name um, as a tribute for uh, uh, of her um, being you know being a big part of this but um, besides that I don't first don't um don't buy the premise of this of the Republican messaging because it is just messaging. I don't believe that they're pro family, pro uh, values at all. You know, because they have had time and time and time again to show that they value families. And if you look at the states that are more likely to ban uh, abortion rights in this country, are the same states that are are uh, are haven't expanded um, Medicaid uh, Medicaid access. Uh, uh, in their states under the Affordable Care Act, and which, and if you overlap that with maternal mortality rates, those are the same states that high, have the highest maternal mortality rates in this country, right? And it, so it's not a surprise if they wanted to do be pro family, pro mother, pro child, they can do something right now, and expand that coverage under the Affordable Care Act, and have a tremendous impact on the, the mortality rates of mothers in this country uh, and especially in their given states. So I don't buy this premise that, you know, oh, if they're not gonna, um, we're not gonna have access to abortion uh, in this country or across the state, we need to do X, Y, and Z. Right now, women are dying because of decisions that they've made and they still haven't taken steps to correct it. When they had a chance to renew and expand um, the child tax credit, when we actually made it re fully refundable, means anybody can get it, and advanceable, that means you get that payment every month, cut child poverty in this country by 60%, 40 to 60%, depending on where you live. They continuously vote against it. So, um, and their paid family programs at the federal level want to take money from Social Security in order to pay for it. So for me, the, the Republican talking points of um, that they're going to be more family friendly. Well, they have the chance now, and they're not doing it. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't fall for their uh, their ideas of what they're going to do if it, if abortion becomes uh, outlawed in their states or or nationally. 
Well, thank you so much, Congressman Gomez, Senator Jackson, and Jennifer Richard for joining us today. That is the end of our panel. It could have definitely, I think, gone much longer, but we are at time. So thank you so much for participating. And, you know, everyone watching, thank you for tuning in. What an incredible panel that was and a great segue into our next round of speakers. I am now so excited to once again welcome Vicki Shabo, Senior Fellow for, for Paid Leave Policy and Strategy at New America's Better Life Lab to moderate our second panel, Research-Based Lessons from California's Historic Paid Leave Program. Vicki is one of the nation's leading experts on gender equity and work. At New America, she focuses on charting a path to winning paid family and medical leave for every working person in the United States, no matter where they live or work or the job they hold. She works closely with lawmakers and advocates to win and advance policies in Congress and in state houses across the country. Over the next 25 minutes, we're going to dig into the evidence that California's paid leave program has generated, demonstrating positive effects on women's labor force participation, maternal and child health, reduced nursing home use, and dispelling any concerns about impacts on the economy. Pretty impressive. In this panel, several of the nation's foremost paid leave researchers will highlight the key findings from the research, including areas of improvement to increase accessibility and uptake. Over to you, Vicki. Thanks so much, Alex, and hello again, everyone. Um, we have a packed panel with a short period of time today. We will barely do justice to the incredible body of research that's resulted from analysis of California's 20 years of paid leave. Um, early research showed the impact of paid leave on leave taking rates, on gendered patterns of leave and factors that increase leave taking among men, return to work for moms and caregivers, reduction in nursing home use and public dollars spent on Medicaid, SNAP and public assistance, and on benefits and lack of harms to businesses. Um, the research also shows where the program falls short and has helped to bolster improvements in California and more equitably designed policies across the country. Um, I'm really excited to introduce the panel whose expertise reflects the importance of paid leave across the lifespan. So I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists and then we'll get right into it. Um, first, we've got Will Dow, Professor of Public Health Policy and Management at the University of California Berkeley School of Public Health. Next, Henry Lee, a neonatologist, a neonatal and perinatal clinician, a professor of pediatrics at Stanford University. Jeff Belisario, executive director of the Bay Area Council Inst Economic Institute. Maya Rossen Slater, an associate professor in the Department of Public Health Policy at Stanford University School of Medicine. Pam Winston, Office of Public of Human Services Policy, uh, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and Professor Douglas Wolf, a public administration professor and a professor of aging studies at Syracuse University. Welcome to all of you. We are gonna dig right in uh, because we wanna get to everything and still wrap up in time for the incredible third panel. Um, so Maya, I'm gonna start with you and we're sort of going through the lifespan here um, with the research. Maya, you along with your co-authors, Jane Waldfogel, Chris Room, Ann Bartell and others, have done a considerable number of uh, studies on California's paid leave program and paid leave programs in other states. I wanna know sort of what stands out to you most about the value of paid leave for workers and for low-income women in particular, um, and then talk a little about the research you did during the pandemic about businesses. Sure, thank you so much for having me as part of this wonderful event. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, so yes, I've been studying the topic of paid family leave and the impact of paid leave on workers, families, and businesses for about a decade now. A key takeaway that has come out of the big literature on this topic is that paid family leave has meaningful benefits for workers and their families, especially with regards to child and maternal health. And this comes along with no major costs or burdens for the employer. So for example, California's policy has been shown to reduce preventable hospitalizations during infancy, increase breastfeeding duration, and improve maternal mental health. The impacts on labor outcomes and career trajectories among women are a bit more mixed, but the bottom line is that there are no large negative effects, as some critics have suggested that there could be. 
Um, in addition, we found that the introduction of California's program substantially increased leave take up among disadvantaged families in particular. So that reduced pre existing disparities um, in leave use along racial and socioeconomic lines. And then the other thing that we have learned is that employers seem to play an important role in the extent to which workers use the program. So for example, in California, there's a substantial amount of variation in paid leave take up between workers who are actually similar on various characteristics, such as their wages, but they work for different employers. And so we think that this might happen for two main reasons. One is the extent to which employers provide accurate and useful information about the program to their workers. And two is the overall culture regarding leave use in that company. So I think one takeaway from this is that one way to increase access to and use of the program is by working more directly with employers and business groups to spread accurate and easy to understand information about the benefits and who's eligible for them and so on. And I think that's important in light of our most recent work on employers, which has found that the introduction of New York's paid leave policy, which was in 2018, did not have any detectable negative impact on small businesses in terms of things like their ability to manage their employee schedules, turnover, profitability. And moreover, lastly, we found that small employers are actually overwhelmingly supportive of their state's paid leave programs, and the support has actually increased during the COVID pandemic. I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Naya. Really appreciate it. Um, and we'll hopefully have a little time for back and forth here. Henry, I want to turn to you. You work with um, parents and babies in the NICU. Um, I want to know sort of from that vantage point, what value do you see for NICU families? What questions do you have that haven't been answered? Um, and what work is left to be done? No, thank you um, so much for this opportunity, uh, Vicki. Yeah, so as a neonatologist, I help care for babies in the NICU and many who are born preterm. And so they may be in the hospital for three to four months after birth. And as context, the United States has one of the highest uh, neonatal infant mortality rates amongst developed countries in the world. And a large part of that is due to the US also having very high preterm birth rates in which there are large disparities by social groups, including race, ethnicity. And so the implementation of paid leave program, um, the program in California has been demonstrated to have led to a decrease in post neonatal infant mortality rates and so that just shows um, such a dramatic impact that can be um, you know, had by uh, such a, a policy. Um, but so having that impact of infant mortality being reduced, it, you might um, also think that there has to be some other benefits that are sort of in the, in the middle there. And so I think there needs to be further research in that regard, particularly for babies who are born preterm. And we know that uh, being um, born preterm, a parent being at the bedside in the NICU can really help to stabilize their physiologic status. It will help the optimal provision of breast milk, which we know is critical for a preterm baby's health and, and for their brain development as well. So uh, preterm birth occurring at a time, probably of course unexpected during pregnancy might lead to an employer as well as the, the worker not necessarily being ready. Um, and so accommodating that time off is very critical for a family to be engaged with their baby in the NICU. So for these reasons, uh, paid leave programs help the mother and the baby, the family. I think there's still work to do in trying to see how we can implement um, these existing policies better for families in the NICU. Thank you. Yeah, um, so many stories uh, about, about parents who just can't be there um, or need to, need to either decide to be with their baby in the NICU or be with their baby when they get out, um, or maybe not at all. Uh, so thank you for, for your work and for that. Um, Pam, I want to turn to you. Your work has focused on the utilization of paid leave programs. And a few years ago, you did some really interesting qualitative research, um, in particular, looking at low-income families. And I'm wondering what, what you have to add um, based on that work and, and your longstanding research on this issue. Yeah, sure. So our office conducted extensive focus groups and interviews with lower income mothers, uh, focusing on their time around childbirth. Um, and most of the moms that we talked with um, used paid family leave, uh, some did not. So we had some point of comparison. And we heard from the vast majority of mothers who took leave about what they perceived as really invaluable benefits in having at least some subsidized time off um, to be with their babies and to bond. They also talked about using the time to recover uh, physically and emotionally. 
um, to address baby's health care needs, so touching on what Henry was talking about, and to just establish new family routines, develop some sense of stability of kind of a new normal, uh, to establish breastfeeding that came up uh, repeatedly, even though it wasn't one of the focuses of our study, um, and also to transition to pumping um, in anticipation of going back to work. Uh, making childcare arrangements took time, and that was a critical use uh, for the time they had off with PFL. And we kept hearing from mothers just about the idea of letting the baby get a little bit older um, before he or she had to go to non-parental care, which was a source of real anxiety for a lot of the parents we talked with. Um, and then I guess finally just getting ready logistically and emotionally to return to work. Um, they did say that paid family leave helped them make that um, transition back to work, and, and that took a little bit of time. Um, many said it was really hard to make ends meet on the partial wage replacement that paid family leave provided, but virtually all of them uh, said that they very much valued having the subsidy. Um, some said that without the program, they'd have felt forced to quit work altogether because they felt that sort of having some time with their babies was a non-negotiable. Um, and others said that without the program, they'd have ended up going back to work within weeks or even days. Um, what was striking was that paid family leave appeared to have the greatest positive impact and importance for the lowest income mothers that we talked with. Um, about 40% of our folks had household incomes under 25,000 a year. Um, and also those with the least family support and those with the most physically demanding jobs. Um, and I just wanna end with the words of one single mom in California uh, who said that at least for those, at least for those weeks, one is at peace. Uh, just very sort of places very high value on this time of sort of being able to focus on their kids and their lives with each other. Wow, at peace. That's mm -hmm. yeah. sticks with you. Um, so we've talked a lot about moms and about the moms piece. Will, I know you've done a lot of work on dads. You were instrumental in um, studying the early effects of a, a San Francisco policy that actually tops up the wage replacement in the state program. Um, at the city level. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that research um, and, and your work overall in this space. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Vicki, for including me in this celebration. And again, kudos to everyone who is involved in this trailblazing work over the last 20 years. So I've been doing work trying to understand the San Francisco paid parental leave ordinance and what we can learn from that. Uh, so that was an ordinance that required employers to top up the wage replacement through the state uh, paid family leave program. So during the, the bonding time to pay 100% of wages. And this is something that's already been talked about is the importance of uh, raising that, that replacement rate for lower income families, especially. And the first thing that we found is echoing what other people have said that employers were strongly supportive of this, even though this was coming out of the employer's pocket. Now, employers are also members of families <laughs> and they strongly support uh, doing this. And so that was that was really important because we don't always get that message uh, that coming out of some of the uh, employer uh, organizations in this space. Second, we found that although you know all women are taking time postnatally, uh, they need to uh, biologically, not many men are, and we've seen that increase over time, as Vicki, you said in your earlier comments. But what we saw in this particular program is it enabled more men financially to take that time off to be home during the bonding period. And that's so important for the baby, for the mother, as well as to continue socializing the acceptability of, of leave taking. So I, I think that that was, um, that was really nice to see. Now, however, having said that, uh, we do find that many of our lower income women in the Bay Area still do not have good understanding of the state benefits to which they're eligible. And this is especially true of lower socioeconomic status women. So we're seeing that still, even though this is narrowed over time, Black and Hispanic mothers are much less likely to claim the state paid family leave benefits that they're entitled to. So working Black mothers, for example, receive on average three weeks fewer of paid parental leave. So at minimum wage, that's about $2,000 of benefits that they paid into the system for that they're not getting. And so there are resources out there to try to help uh, uh, families understand about this, uh, th what they're eligible for, but 
having a state level program, a navigator type program could be incredibly beneficial for so many of these families that aren't getting the access that they need. And this is especially for lower educated families, immigrant families and others are more vulnerable. And finally, what we learned in this uh, work is that although the program works very well for formal sector employees, the state paid family leave wasn't designed to be well suited for those working outside of permanent formal sector jobs. And so many of our vulnerable families have tenuous attachments to the formal labor sector. So moving forward, I would really encourage us all to think more broadly about how to expand benefit eligibility for all new parents, regardless of their work sector. But again, thank you. This is a phenomenal panel today. Thanks so much, Will. So much to unpack in there and so much that's consistent with other research as well, the Navigator point in particular, um, you know, some other research that's shown that it's like high, high, uh, sort of high road employers who tell their workers about the program and make sure they use it, um, which just reinforces some of the inequities that already exist in the structure of the program itself and part of what folks um, who are hosting this event and others are trying to solve with some of the, the legislative changes. Um, Doug, I'm going to turn next to you. We've talked a lot here about the parental leave portion. Um, you and your colleague, Kanika Aurora, studied the family caregiving portion, and in particular, nursing home use. You're an expert in, in aging and caregiving. I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about your research findings um, and, and how this program works for families and uh, people with their own health conditions and, and for caregivers. Sure. Well, uh, like everyone else, thank you very much, Vicki, for uh, including me in this uh, terrific uh, event. So it's widely known that uh, quite a substantial percentage of employed people, are they have to confront the need for care of some sort, care or assistance on the part of a family member or some other uh, close person, often an older parent or, or possibly their spouse. Now, uh, balancing the demands of, a, of paid employment with the demands of unpaid care to a family member, and let's just, let's just focus on the case of the elderly parent, that, can, that balancing can be quite challenging, and taking time off from work to provide care can be costly in terms of foregone wages, if nothing else. Now, in the absence of family care, the options are basically a paid in-home care provider or institutional care, which can be very expensive. So along come California's terrific innovation of paid family leave, which includes caregiving leave, which makes it less costly for an employed person to take time away from work to help attend to their elderly parent or some other family members care needs. And by doing so, it creates the potential to alter the mix of long term care services provided and used by the uh, needy elderly population. And that's what we looked at. Uh, we looked at the first four years after California's law went into effect, comparing it to the four years prior and to other states that didn't have such a law. And we focused on nursing home use. And I think we were quite surprised to find uh, a significant impact. We Now it's gonna sound like a small number. What we found was that on average during those four years after California's law went into effect, the percentage of people 65 or above in the state of California who spent some time in, in a nursing home during a year went down by half or more of a percentage point. So in absolute terms, that's not a big number, but relative to who's to everyone that is in nursing homes, it's actually quite impressive. It was over an 11% decline in nursing home use. And we actually did some rough calculations. Well, how many people does that translate to? Well, it's over 21,000 people spending some time in a nursing home in a year, and that's enough to absolutely fill over 200 average nursing homes in the state of California. So it's impressive. So the, the message I would like to convey to the advocates and the policymakers in this arena is, you know, we've heard from the 
previous panelists about the many benefits to individuals, to workers and their families, and to their to the offspring of these people of uh, paid leave. But there's also public benefits. And the ones I think we need to pay more attention to are possibly reduced Medicare expenditures, reduced Medicaid expenditures for long-term care in, in nursing homes, which can be very, very expensive. Uh, the, the cost of a week of time off with the replacement rates that the California's program produces is much, much less than the cost of a week in a nursing home. And I think we need to be looking at this more and knowing more about it um, and figuring out ways to encourage even greater use of this benefit. Great, Doug, thank you so much. Um, such important work there. And you know, we often hear from one of the things that opponents like to say uh, is that this costs too much. And one of the things that I think a lot of us say back with the help of all of the work that you all have done is that this is a program that pays for itself and more and that people are absorbing and the system is absorbing all sorts of costs uh, right now because of the status quo. Um, so Jeff, I'm gonna turn to you and you may be our closer here because we are running short on time, unfortunately. Uh, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the work that the Bay Area Council did. Um, Bay Area Council is a, a council of employers. Uh, so you, you come from the business perspective and the economic perspective here. I'm wondering if you can talk about the research and the two or three things that really stuck with you about um, business and economic impacts. Yeah. And, yeah. Of course. Thanks so much, Vicki. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, so yeah, the Bayer Council is a business group. Um, we were one of the first business groups in the state to really come out in support of paid family leave. Uh, we sat on the governor's task force in 2019 and 2020, uh, worked on various expansions that have since passed. And really the, the research that we did was meant to inform that task force, but more so kind of dispel some of the myths around paid family leave and how it might have impacts, negative impacts on small businesses in particular. So just a couple of our, our findings, and, and Maya mentioned some of these, we really found no change at all in firm closure rates, particularly among, among small businesses that had an employee use paid family leave compared to those that did not. Um, so there are no massive waves of business closure across industry or firm sizes at, at, that see employees actually take uh, part of the paid family leave program. So that's one. Two, uh, there's actually a benefit um, to businesses often. We actually found a 14% decrease in labor costs um, in firms that had an employee use paid family leave. So a lot of people talk about the need for overtime or the need to hire to replace, but actually that retention over time actually provides big savings for small businesses. And then lastly, a kind of a more overall economic impact, we found that for, for women that were taking part in the paid family leave program, actually their employment rates were 3% higher than in absence of the program. Uh, in particular for women aged 30 to 34, we actually found nearly a 5%, five percentage point employment increase. So um, you know, that's more dollars in the economy, more money being spent, more help for small businesses often too, and that, that money circulates in the economy. So you know, really, uh, you know, we point to our research and our work at, on the task force is kind of pushing this uh, conversation forward. We've brought many more small businesses uh, and large businesses to the table in support of paid family leave. Thank you. I am so tempted to ask you all follow up questions, but I, we have a we need to get to our next speakers and our next panel because they really put a human face on what this program means, as well as provide more context to some of what Jeff was talking about. So I apologize to the panel for running out of time here. Um, we, we have gotten a question about whether um, folks can access your research and your data. And so um, I would invite you all to send us studies that you would like disseminated to the audience and we can make that available in a follow-up email to folks. Um, Doug, Maya, Henry, Will, Pam, and Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for all of the work that you've done um, in helping many of us fight for better policies and um, yeah, be well. Thank you so much. Being able to tell the story of paid leave in California is so critical for not only our own program improvement, but, but also for advocacy at the federal level as we try to pass a national paid leave program. And without data, that story could not be told. So, so big, big thanks to our researcher panelists for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce Amber Bauer, Executive Director of the United Food and Commercial Workers Western States Council for brief remarks. 
The Western States Council is composed of 200,000 UFCW members who work in grocery and retail in the states of California, Arizona, and Nevada, standing together to improve the lives of workers, families, and communities. It is also part of the 1.2 million member strong UFCW International Union. Amber has served as executive director of UFCW Western States since 2019, and prior to that was the council's pol political director. She leads UFCW's political and legislative efforts in Western States and has spent her career in and around California politics and building the strength of organized labor. Welcome, Amber. Thank you so much. What a beautiful moment to come together and celebrate a piece of landmark legislation that has changed people's lives and transformed our communities. I love hearing from all the leaders gathered here in California and across the country about the important role of paid family leave policies. We know these policies are the first step towards ensuring workers don't have to choose between taking care of their families and putting food on the table. I represent 200,000 workers in California, Arizona, and Nevada. Throughout the food sector and pharmacy, farm workers, meatpacking plants, and many other sectors, the very workers who were the catalyst behind implementing the paid family leave program in California. Before September 23, 2002, paid leave was not guaranteed in any state. That means workers routinely had to go to work instead of taking time off to recover from birth, bond with a new baby, or to care for a seriously ill family member. To make ends meet, women in particular were forced to go back to work much too soon. When they weren't fully healed from giving birth, parents lost those critical few months to bond with their baby. We all had to agonize over family members who were critically ill while we were at work, distracted and scared. 20 years ago, workers pushed back on this reality and demanded California become the first state in the nation to provide paid family leave to working families. Giving hardworking parents an opportunity to care for themselves and their families without worrying how to feed that new family. It's always been workers who have led the way because no one knows better than paid family, how important paid family leave is essential to cutting poverty. It's our workers and our members who know that getting up early and working late to put food on their own table, and they understand that struggle. We must protect these workers and their own families, honoring their sacrifice that keeps our economy running. 20 years later, it's clear that we must do much more to make family, fa paid family leave accessible. I was fortunate to have this program in place when I had my own two children. It was a privilege that I could financially make the wage replacement work in order to stay home, recover from childbirth, and bond with my babies. I also know exactly how it feels to wish for a C-section so you have a few extra weeks to stay home with your baby. I've been in work meetings when the daycare texts you because your infant is inconsolable and won't take a bottle. I know how it feels to, to see your baby wave goodbye for the first time as you hide the tears on your way to work. I combine my sick leave and my vacation time with paid family leave to stay home for longer than most moms get, but it still wasn't enough. California is lucky to have some time workers can use to take care of their families, but other states aren't as fortunate. Paid family leave isn't just a women's issue. Increasing access to paid family leave has the potential to transform our communities and our economy. We must view this critical leave as a human right. We must create a culture where parents are encouraged to take leave, and we must continue to fight for contracts that prioritize paid leave for all workers. The push for paid leave must be a movement that happens in every facet of our lives, our workplaces, our grocery stores, the halls of our capital. California can once again lead the country if we work together to make the paid family leave program truly equitable and accessible to all. Let us all be a part of the movement, expanding leave for all families and to dream about what is possible. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. That was beautiful. The, the perspective and voice of your members is invaluable to these conversations. So we appreciate you being here. 
Our third and final panel, Paid Leave and Practice for Workers, Families, and Businesses, will be moderated by Sharon Terman, Director of the Work and Family Program and Senior Staff Attorney at Legal Aid at Work, a nonprofit legal services organization that has been assisting low-income working families for more than 100 years. Sharon is an expert on family and medical leave policies and has played a key role in crafting several landmark laws improving California's work family policies. Today, we have heard from lawmakers about the why behind their tireless support of paid leave and from our researchers about the data that reinforces the support. We are now going to turn our attention to where the rubber meets the road, the real life implications of California's paid leave program on workers, on families, on businesses, on communities. This panel will center us in the experiences of those on the ground, allowing us to reflect on what has been made possible in these past 20 years and where we can and must do better. Take it away, Sharon. Thank you, Alex. At Legal Aid at Work, we hear firsthand how vital paid leave is for working families because we hear from over a thousand Californians every year on our work and family helpline who need leave to care for themselves or their loved ones. Their stories have inspired us to push for equitable, accessible paid leave, especially for lower paid and marginalized workers. Our clients' experiences are not unique. Every one of us at some point in our lives will either need care or need to provide care to someone we love. Caring for each other is part of being human, and no one should have to risk their economic stability to welcome a new child or be with an ailing family member. In this panel, we will hear from workers, advocates, and businesses who will share their perspectives about how important paid family leave is in practice and about the work we still have to do to ensure that all families can benefit. We're honored to have five outstanding panelists with us today. Jerry Sandoval Neri is a proud member of Parent Voices, a parent led grassroots organizing effort um, fighting to make quality childcare accessible and affordable for all families. Jerry's also a proud member of the California Work and Family Coalition and his experiences with paid leave as a new dad inspired him to become a paid leave advocate. Mary Ignatius is the statewide organizer of Parent Voices. Um, she also uh, is a mom who benefited from paid family leave twice after giving birth to her two sons. She's grateful to the many organizations who fought to pass it and inspired by the parent leaders who continue to fight for its improvements. Dr. Donna Benton is the president of the Association of California Caregiver Resource Centers. She has worked in the field of aging for over 30 years, and her volunteer experience with the Gray Panthers in high school inspired her career as an advocate for improving how we all view the natural process of aging. Kirk Vartan is a New York native and co-owner, co-founder, and general manager of a slice of New York pizza shop in Santa Clara and Sunnyvale. In 2017, Kirk turned both shops into the South Bay's first retail employee-owned worker cooperative. Kirk is a small business majority network member and spends much of his time educating local, state, and federal officials. And finally, Jenna Johnson is the president of Patagonia's apparel and equipment business, working to advance Patagonia's mission to save our home planet by bringing environmental stewardship to the company's technical innovation. She has an executive MBA from the University of Washington, and her roles as a rock climber, wife, and mother of two keep her grounded, living simply and optimistic for a more environmentally just future. Jerry, I'm going to start with you. Can you share a bit about your experience with paid leave and how it impacted you and your family? And also why did it lead you to advocate for improvements to the program? Thank you very much, Sharon. And first of all, thanks everybody uh, here for allowing me to speak a little about my experience. Uh, yes, I am uh, a member of Parent Voices as well as California Working Coalition. Uh, but most importantly, I am a proud parent. And when my child was born, um, I went through that uh, uh, paid leave experience where, first of all, I had no idea I could take it as a male parent. I always understood it was a benefit for the mother, which uh, in my head it was uh, understandable. But when somebody told me that I had that right as well uh, because I was paying taxes, then um, I tried and attempted to take uh, paid leave. Uh, so I ended up uh, uh, going through it. Uh, um, but when I first got my first paycheck, I realized that it wasn't enough. I only got 60% of my paid, and uh, I was already struggling with 100% of my paid as it was. So uh, you can understand that if I only got 60%, uh, 
it was going to be a really, really uh, hardship on my uh, experience with it. And uh, I was heartbroken because I had to return back to work, especially because I was very excited to uh, when I got to meet my, my newborn and uh, I had to leave her home. I uh, didn't get a chance to take the full paid leave because obvious reasons that, that I just mentioned. Uh, so it was really a struggle at that point uh, for me. Uh, I do believe that um, uh, we need to uh, extend it for sure, just because uh, it, it, I'm not the only one. I feel like I had it uh, very, very easy, but I believe there are people out there who are struggling way, way more than I do. So uh, I thought that I had it made, you know, as a male parent going to work and, and working for my family and then realizing that I, I was not going to make it with 60%, it was crazy. So um, I became an advocate for obvious reasons, you know, going through it, then experiencing the bads of it. Uh, and I, I realized that uh, I, had to, I had the opportunity to do something about it when I joined Parent Voices. Um, then after that, I joined uh, uh, California Working Family Coalition. And you know what? It was an honor being a, or have been, it has been an honor going through this experience with uh, California Working Family Coalition because uh, of my situation. Um, I'm not here to speak about just myself, but I speak for the community uh, out there. Um, you know, the people um, that can take advantage of this are, are those who make money to save money. And, and the people who struggle with, like me have no choice but to stay working. And, and uh, I think that we all have to take uh, advantage of this benefit at one point or another because we need to be there for our family. Thank you so much, Jerry, for sharing your story and also for translating your experience into advocacy for other families. Mary, I'm going to go to you next. Um, I know you advocate for families in your professional life, but you also took paid family leave um, after both your children were, were, were born. So can you share about your experience and what it meant for you and your family that you were able to take paid family leave? Yeah, thank you. Um, I first just need to thank Patty Siegel, the former executive director of the California Child Care Resource and Referral Network, and Kim Kruckel with the Child Care Law Center, and our Parent Voices members, the child care advocates who have contributed to this movement um, that allowed me to then um, be able to take paid family leave. Um, I was pregnant with my second child and found out that he would be born with a condition called club feet that left untreated, he wouldn't be able to walk. And the doctors told me that the sooner we started treatment after he was born, the better. And so um, from the time he was 10 days old till the time he was eight weeks old, he wore these little casts and we would go into the doctor's office. They would fix his little feet, put the cast on a week later, cut it off, mess with his feet, put the cast back on and on and on for eight weeks um, until eventually he would wear braces. Uh, today he's nine years old, his feet are perfect, he is a fearless soccer player, and he's, he's just wonderful, and I really credit the paid family leave program because when his treatment was the most critical was when I was using paid family leave. I could focus 100% on what he needed um, and what I needed because I was freaking out, I was worried, I was nervous, I didn't have to worry about where my bills were going to get paid, and you know, unlike Jerry, I worked at a job that I had accrued enough sick and vacation to make up so that I could have 100% pay. And that was a privilege for me. Um, but like Jerry and other parents, um, that is not their privilege and they deserve access to this program. And we have other parents like Maria who would tell us that, you know, she was so happy she gave birth on Friday so that she could go back to work on Monday or Jasmine who was, let, who was so happy she gave birth at night so that the next day she could finish her college final. And so for too many families in Parent Voices, accessing a program they pay into is still so far removed from what they think is possible. And so that's why we're part of the coalition. We fight for those moms, we celebrate paid family, but we celebrate it by working harder to make it accessible. Um, to all. So, and we need the governor to sign SB 951. Thank you, Thank you Mary. That was beautifully said. Um, Donna, moving to you next. Uh, you are an expert in family caregiving for dementia and older adults. And I know we've talked about how many people think yes. of baby bonding when they think of paid family leave, but can you share why paid family leave is so important for unpaid family caregivers, especially for older adults? 
Absolutely. And again, I want to thank you for uh, get, allowing me to be on this panel. Um, you know, one of the things that we've noticed in, in, in California, we have about 5 million unpaid family caregivers caring for somebody with some type of cognitive impairment. And during that time, about 40% are working. But when they're working, they are trying to balance that with caregiving at home, which is usually like another 20 hours a week. And for our clients, when um, we're able to talk to them about the ability to take paid family leave, um, sometimes they need this so that they can set up care for the person they're caring for so they can get safely back to work. Sometimes they need it so that intermittently they can go and get to the doctor's appointment so that they can be that advocate for that older adult while they're there. We find that, um, you know, over time, the family structure has changed so much and more people are um, have less family members to help care for an older adult. So when they're working, they don't have somebody to turn to and say, hey, can you come and take care of mom who may have Alzheimer's and isn't safe? And so you can't just leave, you know, every day at home and you may not have an alternative person. We also found that um, because of the... Um, not surprisingly, a lot of our caregivers are women and women of color. And because of the kind of socio-political roots that devalues the contribution of family caregivers, um, we've also found that they're less likely to stay in the job market if when in their you know, 40s or 50s, they become family caregivers and they're caring for maybe a child at home. So them leaving the job market makes it harder because these are chronic conditions. It goes on for eight years on average. And if they try to go back into the job labor market, they're not able to get back into the labor market. So now you've impacted not only the, the generation now, but future generations, which can then lead to a cycle of poverty for these family caregivers. But if, you, if they were able to take care, leave during that time, they're able to stay in the job market. They're able to continue to contribute and not um, have to you know, leave because they have to care for somebody that they love who took care of them and we wanna give back. And that's a value that so many of us share. So we want that financial health across generations. And I think this is why we keep struggling and fighting to improve uh, P PFL in California and for our population People forget one out of every four families will be impacted by this um, at some point. Thank you so much, Donna, for highlighting the importance of paid leave across the lifespan. I am now excited to move to um, two amazing um, business representatives. And I wanna say, I know that Senator Jackson had spoken earlier about how historically there have been some um, parts of the business community who have been in opposition to these um, programs. But I wanna say that we have uh, immense gratitude for businesses like a slice of New York, like Patagonia, like the Bay Area Council's folks, and so many others who really break the mold and support their workforce and understand the benefits of these programs for both um, workers and employers. So I'm um, going to you next, uh, Kirk. I want to ask you, as a small business owner, how, how do you see paid family leave supporting um, businesses like yours? We can't hear you. you. Might be muted. No, I'm. We're still not hearing you. So how's that? Better. Oh, that's much better. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Not sure what happened. Apologize. It was working before. Okay. Well, I just I started with. I just wanted to thank you for letting me speak today and um, mentioned our pizza shops just celebrated our 16 year anniversary on Monday and we became a worker cooperative just over five years ago. As a general manager and the only management in our business, I see my duties being twofold. First, successful shop operations, escalation, and solvency. And second, to maximize income for our team. As a co-op, our board immediately formed two committees, Culture and Accountability, also known as the Culture Club, and the Finance and Employee Benefits Committee. One of the first policies the Finance and Employee Benefits Committee passed was establishing a PTO policy, which we never had before. We formalized our employee wellness policy that retains and fully covers the cost of chiropractic and massage services, established an employee loan policy, a holiday policy, and recently a 401k plan. 
a few years ago, one of our members became pregnant. Well, actually, his wife became pregnant. And as a board member, he asked us to consider a family benefit. While not many of our members are new family focused, we felt it was part of our culture to support and foster our team's personal needs and growth. We looked at the state's program and saw it was a six week benefit that covered 60% of the employee's salary. So we created our own paid family leave policy that allows our members to take the six weeks per the state's program. And our co-op would cover the 40% difference in salary, even retroactively for members that had babies before this policy was adopted. This year, when another baby came along, we reviewed our, and updated our policy to cover the full eight weeks. The paid, family, the paid Family Leave Act is truly something to be celebrated as small businesses like ours do not have the resources or scale to fully care for our team. I can say with absolute certainty that we need better access to healthcare and services like this in the year ahead. And I'm honored to be part of this 20 year celebration of the Paid Family Leave Act. Thank you so much, Kirk, um, and thank you for all you do for your employees and for the community. Um, finally, Jenna, um, in addition to being an extraordinary leader on the environment, as reflected by your founder's groundbreaking announcement last week that he's donating the entire company to fight climate change, Patagonia also has been a leader in family supportive workplace policies from paid leave to on-site child care. Can you share your perspective on why and how California's paid family leave program benefits employers and what has your experience been with providing paid leave to your workforce? Yeah, thank you so much. Really nice to be here with um, all of you who are on the panel today. You know, I, I really feel like part of paid leave is just an ethical and a moral obligation that we really need to take seriously. But I will also speak on behalf of the fact that it is also a really important business imperative in this very tight labor market that's out there at the moment. And the fact that all of us who are in any business are competing in a business to stay alive. You want the best people in your company working for you. And today, what that means is taking care of, respecting, showing dignity to your workers. And so these support systems become absolutely fundamental to how you can run a successful business. And we have certainly proved that over time. Um, I'll say, Sharon, I'm really, I'm really grateful for you for kind of the kind words that you said about about those of us who have been in this for a while and have provided really strong support systems for our workers. And yet I often say that it pains me to hear when people say that because I truly don't want that to be a competitive advantage of Patagonia. I want that not for us to be an exception or unusual or exceptional, but we should be the norm. What we're providing to our workers is truly just a sense of dignity and respect and honor for our workers and the fact that they have lives and the ability to create really powerful support systems that honor that is so important. And when I speak to kind of the, the business side of it, what we've found is that we can build a more equitable and a more productive workforce by putting these support systems in place. It allows us to attract really important best in class talent. Like I mentioned a minute ago, it allows us to retain that talent in a really important way. Um, for example, we found that our employees the way I like to describe it is I like to think of us as a partner in life and not an obstacle in life. And what that means is that what we found is that when our women go out on maternity leave, all of them come back to work for us post maternity leave, which then means we now have a workforce that is at least 50% women and including 50% women in upper management roles. And that is directly linked to the fact that we have been very intentional about putting these support systems in place for our working families. And that will continue to be an important part of what we do. But what I really continue to advocate on behalf of is that, again, I don't want this to be a competitive advantage. And California has done such a great job at being a leader in this. Still a lot more work to be done. Mary, I join you in pushing everyone who's listening to call um, the governor's office and get SB 951 moved through and off of his desk and approved. Um, and then, you know, then we can go on to the conversation about the fact that California should not be unusual in the same way that Patagonia should not be unusual. And we really need to keep fighting for this at a national level so that all of our workers across this country can have that dignity and that respect. I travel globally often and it is embarrassing, I will say, to travel around the world and know 
um, what we're failing on for our people in this country. Thank you so much, Jenna, for your inspiring words and for the work you do to protect our planet and working families. Um, I want to ask one more question of each of you, and um, we have time if we keep our answers short. So I'd like to just go in the order that we started. And um, the question is, what is one thing you wish policymakers understood about paid leave? So starting with you, Jerry. Hi, thank you. So my answer to that would be, um, I wish they understood the struggle that all the, the people have, you know, I wish they would have gone through it so they could understand uh, what we are going through and what we are asking for. We're not just asking for this for just to ask for it, like where any kid will ask for uh, a toy, right? But uh, we want uh, my, I wish they understood the struggle. That, that's my answer to that. Thank you, Mary. Well, Jerry, you're just gonna have to run for office so more people understand that struggle. I just, for me, it's that, you know, my story is about my son having club feet as if that's like a justification as to why I deserve to be at home with him. Um, I think for any of us, you know, we are not robots. We are human beings and we have lives outside of work and we have people who need us outside of work. and whether it's for a newborn, an adopted child, or one of, you know, um, an elderly family member, we should have the right to care for them when they are in their most vulnerable times. And I just feel like there should be no justification. It should be a right. It's about our humanity. It's about, about our dignity. So beautiful. Thank you. Donna. I would say that um, caring is everyone's business. It is something that is good for business, it's good for our economy. And I think someone said that, um, somebody's much smarter than me said that we're judged by how we treat our the youth and our elderly. And so this is what we, we don't wanna be judged on not allowing people to provide care when, um, and having to make a choice between work and family or friends. Absolutely, yeah, chosen family. Um, Kurt. Totally chosen family. Um, any, anything we can do that enables small businesses to care for their team is critical. There are many daily struggles, especially in businesses like ours that are physically demanding. Having programs like paid family leave to provide salary replacement to employees that are starting a family or caring for existing family members is a huge benefit and one we could not do on our own. I fully support legislation and programs that provide essential coverages to lost income, including current bills like SB 951 that would grow salary coverage to 90%. My key message for policymakers is this, taking time to build a successful family without worrying about losing hours and income at work, a high risk in one's ability to pay for the cost of the very family they are building is critical for the sanity of all workers in every small business. And I hope you will continue to fund, embrace and expand this program. I love that. And finally, Jenna. Yeah, I agree with all of my co-panelists. Um, and I think I would just compliment it from a business point of view and saying that we have proven, and I believe very strongly, that these programs pay for themselves. So a lot of the concern is around the cost of them. Um, but we've spoken to just a few of the many elements in which um, in ways that we actually get back what we put into these types of programs and spades. And so when we look around the world, many others have led much farther than we have in proving that that's true. And so we have lots of examples that we can learn from in order to do this in a smart and responsible way. Thank you to Jerry, Mary, Donna, Kirk, and Jenna for sharing your insights and for being an inspiration to all of us in the work that you do. And on behalf of the co-hosts of today's event, I want to thank all of our distinguished speakers and paid leave champions for being a part of this celebration. We've heard today about the wide ranging benefits of paid leave for workers and employers, and about the tireless work by legislative leaders and advocates over the past two decades to make California's paid leave program more inclusive and responsive to the needs of all families especially low paid workers, black and brown, immigrant and LGBTQ plus communities. Because of this advocacy, millions of Californians have been able to take leave to welcome a new child or tend to ill family members without losing their full pay. Paid leave has improved the health of our families, businesses and communities. I also wanna underscore that our work here isn't done. 
Legal Aid at Work, the California Work and Family Coalition, and so many of the folks here today are hard at work to make sure Californians know about and can use the benefits they're entitled to. We're also hard at work to strengthen the program so that more people have access to paid leave, including through improvements like Senator DeRosso's SB 951, which is currently sitting on Governor Newsom's desk. We won't stop until all people can be there for their loved ones during life's most meaningful moments without having to risk their livelihood. Thank you for being with us today, and we invite you to join us as we continue to advocate for better protections, both in California and nationally. We look forward to celebrating even more progress in the years to come in achieving equitable paid leave for all.